I was going to perform for you a Metallica song this morning, and now you're not going to have to hear it. So those of you who would not have enjoyed that do not have to sit through it. But you are going to have to look at this hideous shirt while I uh, begin my, my message here. So, um, so the Metallica song, Sad But True, is the song that I was gonna sing for you. And I'm, I'm just gonna read the lyrics for you real quick. Oh, I wanna make a disclaimer right away. This message wrote itself a while back. So uh, it was not written this week. It was not finalized this week. Um, so some of the things may sound like they're, uh, I mean, you know, the Lord knows the timing of everything. So, but um, anyway, all right, this song, the lyrics say, hey, I'm your life. I'm the one who takes you there. Hey, I'm your life. I'm the one who cares. They, they betray. I'm your only true friend now. They, they betray. I'm forever there. I'm your dream, make you real. I'm your eyes when you must steal. I'm your pain when you can't feel, sad but true. I'm your dream, mind astray. I'm your eyes while you're away. I'm your pain while you repay. You know it's sad but true. You, you're my mask. You're my cover, my shelter. You, you're my mask. You're the one who's blamed. Do, do my work. Do my dirty work, scapegoat. Do, do my deeds, for you're the one who's shamed. I'm your dream, make you real. I'm your eyes when you must steal. I'm your pain when you can't feel, sad but true. I'm your dream, mind astray. I'm your eyes while you're away. I'm your pain while you repay. You know it's sad but true. Hate, I'm your hate. I'm your hate when you want love. Pay, pay the price, pay for nothing's fair. Hey, I'm your life, I'm the one who took you there. Hey, I'm your life and I no longer care. I'm your dream, make you real. I'm your eyes when you must steal. I'm your pain when you can't feel, sad but true. I'm your truth, telling lies. I'm your reason, alibis. I'm inside, open your eyes, I'm you. Sad but true. So this song is, uh, this is the shirt for the sad but true song that they developed. It's hideous, I know, and I'm sorry. Um, but it is an image that I wanted to just have with me as we lead into this message. So that's not a very hopeful message, right? That song is about the inner struggle, the inner voices that eat away at your insecurities. And all of us have been in those places. I mean, my gosh, this week alone, I was almost completely taken out by inner voices of insecurity, almost completely annihilated. And Heather was just like, ah, I'm just gonna give you some space. <laughs> I'm going to put all the knives away and I'm just going to give you some space. So, um, but we let those voices eat us up throughout life. And sometimes we don't even stop to realize that they're doing it. So uh, it's our struggle with our false self. In a post-God world, so many have decided to worship self or death, essentially. When we worship ourself, we worship death, the absence of God, sin, right? I mean, maybe that's not entirely true. Maybe we could theologically debate it, but it's essentially true. Um, I remember a time when Matt Kenner is a good friend of mine, and he had a 50th birthday party, and we are both huge Metallica fans. And he took a bunch of guys to see Metallica in a movie theater. So it was very different because you're disconnected from the live experience thing that happens when you're at a real concert. You're just left to analyze what's going on on a screen, basically, at this point. And we brought Peter, and at that point in time, we were like, suddenly very aware of all of the death imagery around what Metallica does while they're on stage. Like, it was just like, I remember... <laughs> yeah, you were. Well, you were our, our pastor, right? So we were like, oh, we brought our pastor into hell, essentially. Like, all this worship of death. Like, it was just, it, when we left there, we, we became so acutely aware of it that Matt and I were just laughing. We're like, I never really noticed that before, did you? And like, but there's, you know, their, their whole thing with Metallica is it looks like, from the outside, the worship of death, right? And, I mean, this is their... This is their artist that does all this stuff for them. So um, another take on this song, though, is, well, I think that this shirt is a picture of death 
examining death, right? This skull is holding its other skull that is part of it and analyzing the other side of it, right? So um, another take on this song could be an invitation for us, for you, to look at yourself when you see all the hateful or violent things that happen in the world and ask, am I really much better than what I see around me? Because I know when I'm left to my own devices, oftentimes I'm not. I can speak for myself only. Um, so, all right, out of the grave and into, <laughs> into hope. Um, I'm going to leave this because I don't want to try to put my other shirt back on, so I'm sorry. I'll put it on before communion. How about that? Oh. <laughs> um, so, we, we were, a lot of us here in the church went to a conference last weekend, and Brad that spoke here last weekend was at the conference and kind of sharing from some of the stuff that he's written. Um, Brad's an old friend of Peter's, an old friend of the sanctuary, um, a really just wonderful voice in the world of ultimate reconciliation. I don't think he'd call himself a universalist, which is okay, but he is a, a strong, powerful voice in the world of God redeeming everything. And uh, it was a treat to have him here. But so last weekend was like a super high for me. I was like, I should have seen it coming this week because um, it was a super high. I was coming off the super high. We had David Artman visit and he's talking about planning a conference, wants to do it with us in 2025. And uh, everything that Brad and Brian shared at the conference and the people that we met, it was totally exciting to find that there was another church in town that was even kicking this around. Like that was a shock to us. That was a surprise to me anyway, um, and a wonderful surprise. So I'm going to transition to this concept of uh, deconstruction and reconstruction. Before I do that, I do have one more, one more note I wanted to make. Um, I'll come back to that, actually. Um, so who in here is familiar with deconstruction, the term? Who has heard the term deconstruction? All right, good. Fair number. So essentially, deconstruction is, uh, a, I found this definition, a phenomenon within American evangelicalism specifically in which Christians rethink their faith and jettison previously held beliefs sometimes to the point of no longer identifying as Christian is the way that I found it described for me. So that's what Google thought I needed to see as the definition. Um, they would know best, right? Why, why would I question what they have for me? Um, Brad describes what is happening in our culture in this deconstruction process, and it is happening, that people are questioning parts and pieces of their faith. Some people feel like it's like a jingle puzzle, and if you pull out the wrong one, then the whole thing's gone. Um, but Brad calls it the great deconstruction because it almost is a movement inside of the church, like these big schisms that we see throughout the centuries as we look at church history. But this morning, I wanted to talk about deconstruction versus demolition. Because when I heard deconstruction, I typically thought of the old videos of casinos being demolished. Like if you've seen these, these uh, you know, they're fun to watch. There's, uh, there are collections of them on YouTube, but they set all the charges and they get ready and they do a big countdown and then they just level the building, right? It just <laughs> collapses into the ground. All rubble, just a big mess left and uh, a big cleanup to come. Within seconds, everything is leveled. That's actually demolition, but that's what I pictured when I was picturing deconstruction all along, and Brad helped me to see that a little bit differently, which was, uh, which was a helpful thing. Um, tearing it all down, reducing it to rubble, that's demolition. So if you've heard of the term deconstruction, hopefully you've also heard of the term reconstruction. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And how many of you have, are familiar with the concept in church of uh, the wall building mentality, right? From, this is a Nehemiah thing. So if anyone that's been through a Nehemiah study has been through the wall building concept, right? Or maybe you've heard of like a barn raising. Church is a barn raising. Everybody comes together and they raise the structure and they work together. And, you know, that imagery sometimes is bandied around. Maybe you've heard it takes a village, right? It takes a village. Everybody comes together. They do this together. So that's kind of what I always thought reconstruction looked like. I think that imagery is okay. 
but I think somewhat insufficient. I think the focus in that imagery is, is honestly in the wrong place sometimes. It shifts the focus away from the body of Christ being raised in each of us to some sort of thing that we create together, right? We raise those walls, we put that roof on, and we, um, it creates the belief that one day it will be ready for service. One day we'll, we'll move into service after this is all done, after this work is all done. Creates the idea that until it looks a certain way, it's not finished, right? It's not finished yet. Um, and I think that's sad but true. But in my experience, our faith is more about the journey than the destination. So the workers that are there working together maybe more, um, the journey together with others is so much more interesting than the journey in isolation. Um, anyone here enjoy hiking by yourself? isolation by yourself. It can be very restorative, right? But it's more fun to hike with others, I think. Maybe not too many others, but um, more fun to hike with others. Does anyone here play team sports by themselves? No? No? That's not so fun. Um, anyone here play team sports and only have one team? No? Not so much. You kind of need resistance there a little bit to have a good time. Well, Brian Zond described reconstruction as restoration, and I thought this was interesting imagery um, that he brought to the table. The image of a piece of art being renovated to expose a masterpiece of beauty. And this concept for me is good, but it's still a little too pretty and a little too safe. And it falls under the one and done mentality in my mind about sin. So it doesn't work as well for me for, rec for reconstruction. Reconstruction, I think, is more like a live-in remodel. Who here has lived through a live-in remodel? I know Judy. <laughs> and they, they are hard, they are hard. But I propose that the decon-recon process is more like a live-in remodel, knocking out walls, tearing out floors, rebuilding sections at a time. We can't go in that section of the house because it's not working yet right now. And you could tell that by all the dust that's on this section of the house, right? So uh, we're working on that. It's a work in progress. We're going to get there. It's dirty, it's inconvenient, it's hard, and it's ongoing. Hopefully it gets finished. It can be finished, right, Judy? <laughs> Um, we've been living with one for quite a while, right in front of us, well, in back of some of you, but right in front of some of us, uh, this, this lift, right? This work in progress that's been going on forever. It's a good example of some of the blocks that you can counter as well, because we run in, in this, this remodel, we've run into issues with the city a number of times and coding. And I just thought, wow, that's really literally an example of the law getting in the way of a remodel, right? It's a literal block by the law, walking in and saying, can't do that, can't do that. You don't have permission to do that. So as we explore the decon recon mission today as a live-in remodel, I think it's important for us to take a look at what I believe to be the key element to reconstruction. This is just me, take it or leave it. I think the key element to reconstruction is love. Marisa inspired me when she shared recently, and she used this passage. She caused me to revisit the love passage, 1 Corinthians 13. It's, all, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. I dismiss it because it's everywhere. And it's in everybody's house. It's at everybody's wedding. It's like posted on everybody's wall. You go into Kohl's or you go into a store that has signs, and there it is. It's everywhere. Um, and that's encouraging that it's everywhere, but when she had me sit with it recently, it occurred to me that while it is everywhere and used everywhere, it's used everywhere, it doesn't seem to be understood everywhere necessarily. So the fresh reading of it kind of brought me back to it when I was working through what I was going to talk about today. The man-made love, this processed love, I'm going to call it processed love because everyone's good with that language. You got to avoid processed foods, right? That's the most dangerous thing in the world. So processed love is pretty dangerous for you too, it turns out. That's winning out around us in the world a lot today. A man-made processed love. 
Retributive justice rues the day. Setting fire to things can feel so much more fun. That's why I wore these shirts, why I went to these shows. I got in there and moshed and took the chance that I was going to come out with a broken arm or whatever it might be, um, just to get lost in the destruction, right? The fire, the death. Um, choosing the way of the cross will provide the love of God, resulting in peace that is unexplainable and joy that is simply unspeakable. And so we're going to read through 1 Corinthians. It's occurring to me that I did not write it down. So Sasha, I will read it from the screen. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, we'll start with. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I don't know why, but that made me think of Genie in the old Aladdin movie. Um, phenomenal cosmic power in itty bitty living space. Um, to be able to do those things and not, and not even have love is a real quandary to me even. <laughs> To, to have the power of God to do the things that he's talking about, but not to see the power of, the dunamis power of God's love is, is interesting. So next slide, please. So 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven tells us, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, this is basically traditionally, typically what I see when I turn on the news or if I go to a social media outlet like Twitter or Facebook, this is usually the representation I see of everyone in the world. So that, that's nice. So sarcasm. I'm a very sarcastic person. So if you don't get sarcasm, I have to help you out. I never see that. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Oh man, that's, <laughs> I just, I need to put that up. I need to take the first part down because I'm kind of giving up on that but, and put that up and just remember when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. We're living in the partial. So there was a lot of talk at the conference last weekend about our, host, our uh, churches being more like hospitals than courtrooms. Right, now we're getting to the part that you're going to understand why I made that disclaimer. Um, so after centuries of selling the courtroom model of faith, I think we've totally missed the mark. As much as our current society loves courtrooms, courtrooms are going to solve all of our problems. I agree with an early church father, St. John Chrysostom, who said something like this. This is an interpretation of, I think, Russian, right? So he was a... <laughs> Something like that. Okay, it's Greek. He spoke Greek. All right. The, the church is a hospital and not a courtroom for souls. She does not condemn on behalf of sins, but grants remission of sins. Nothing is so joyous in our life as the thanksgiving that we experience in the church. In the church, the joyful sustain their joy. In the church, those worried acquire merriment and those saddened joy. In the church, the troubled find relief and the heavy laden rest. Come, says the Lord, near me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden with trials and sins, and I will give you rest. What could be more desirable than to meet this voice? What 
is sweeter than this invitation to enter into that space. The Lord is calling us, is calling the church, is calling us to the church for a rich banquet. He transfers our struggles to rest and from tortures to relief. He relieves us from the burden of our sins. I've got a bunch of yous in here. I was like, he relieves you, but he relieves us. Sorry. Um, He heals worries with thanksgiving and sadness with joy. No one is truly free or joyful besides he who lives for Christ. Such a person overcomes all evil and does not fear anything. So I threw out the idea that, you know, churches are more like hospitals than courtrooms to Lily. And she was like, who wants to go to a hospital? (laughs) I said, it's a good point. That is a very good point. Who wants to go to a hospital? Well, no one wants to go to a hospital until your pain becomes so much that you can't think of not going to the hospital, right? So I did that. I had to to self-surrender not too long ago on my birthday. Thought I was having a heart attack. Had symptoms I was worried about. They weren't, they were persisting. And so I, I laid there during the day thinking, Heather said, all right, you'll either, you'll take yourself if you feel like you need to, or when I get back, I'm taking you. And I was like, okay, how do I get out of this? (laughs) I think I feel fine. I feel fine. (laughs) I didn't want to go. Nobody wants to go to the hospital until they're driven by pain. Nobody wants to have a baby until it's time to get the baby out, right? Like, uh, I'm terrified of this. I don't want to do it, but it is time right now. Let's go. Peter's always saying that one of the problems that he struggles with is that the pain drives people in to church. They get what they're looking for, and then what do they do? They check out, right? They check out of the hospital. I got to check out. I walked out of there. I wasn't looking back. Um, I knew I owed him some money, but that was the only thing I was going to have to do with them in the future. Um, but guess what? The pain is always there. The pain It's sad but true, but the pain is always there. The disease of sin can go into remission, but it isn't cured in our space-time. It doesn't seem to me. Um, Brad had a great quote at that conference. He said, you can't punish the disease out of someone. And if sin is just separation from God, it's a disease, and you can't punish a disease out of someone. I believe that the evangelical flavor of church has turned this statement into something that it's not intended to be, that the church is a hospital for sinners to be cured of their sins. And if there are sinless people walking around out there somewhere. All I need to do is just check myself into one of the local hospitals and I too can walk around sinless. And, uh, and that, that's a recipe for judgment <laughs> pretty quickly if I do get to do that. I don't get to do that. So um, I, don't have to, I don't have to worry about it so much, but it's a one and done sin fix is what's preached, I think, a lot of times. That you're not preaching the sin into remission, you're preaching the cure of sin. You too could have this great cure if you just do what I tell you to do. After all, none of us wants to live in a hospital, right? I mean, you don't want to stay in a hospital your whole life. I don't anyway. I don't think anybody does. But remission is not one and done. It's not eradication. The cross eradicated sin, yes. But I'm saying in our space time, it sure doesn't seem like it took yet. So we are in a place where we deal with sin still in our life and we need to constantly surrender. We need to get the treatment, quote unquote, to get it back into remission, if you will. Um, That's different. That's different from today, if you just do this, I'll set you loose and you don't have to worry about sin anymore. We need healed more than we need corrected. The next time you're tempted to correct someone's thinking, take a second, try to understand that they're likely in need of healing of some sort. And ask yourself, can you offer something better than what you just planned to offer before you took the time to have that thought? Brad had another great comment, I'm really quoting Brad a lot today, but um, he had a big impact on me and has had in the past. He had another great comment and observation on the burnout and exhaustion that those in our Christian faith are experiencing, being similar to that of our medical 
staff today. Our medical institutions today are experiencing a similar type of burnout and dropout rates. Part of the real messiness of church is that we all work here. We all volunteer here in some capacity. You probably take the message to try to talk to your friends. Like there's some level of involvement. It's a little bit different from a hospital in that way. But we're not the healers, but we care for those that are being healed. There was a, a comment, so that quote that I read from John, St. John, uh, there was a comment underneath the quote that I thought was powerful. So this is whoever's comment that made this. Jesus, or just like Jesus, the church is here to heal you, not to contest your disposition, to reconcile you to God, not to condemn you, to embrace you, not to exclude anyone, to love you, not to judge you, to show you compassion, not rejection, to show you liberation and redemption, not guilt and grief, to manifest Jesus, not the Pharisees. The world needs this church back, even if it thinks it doesn't want it. I believe that the sanctuary is a representation of this ancient style of church, this belief. We are an example for the world that we can trust God enough to be this church again. Now is the time for us to think, now is not the time for us to think that we've created some new exciting movement, um, you know, that we've got a new great idea that everyone needs to get behind. We're simply shifting focus back to an ancient faith that, that got lost in what I refer to as vitamin R, vitamin R being religion. Um, it's, it's a Chevelle song. It's a, another rock band, but a Christian rock band that wrote a song called Vitamin R. Well, what's a vitamin? It's a man-made whole food substitute, right? I don't want to eat vegetables so much. I mean, I'll eat a little bit of vegetables, but they taste crappy. I wanna, I'd rather take a pill that some person has extracted all the good parts, all the fruit from the veg, vegetables, pressed it into a pill, and I can just take that, right? It's, it's a supplement. It's a supplement. Yeah, right. But you just told yourself you're not going to eat broccoli because you ate that vitamin, right? So you tell all your person in your life who wants you to take the vitamin, oh, it's just a supplement. It's just, it's extra, it's extra. But then you scrape the broccoli in the trash or the cauliflower or pick your vegetable. And they're all, <laughs> they're all equal in my mind. Um, so that's a manufactured thing, right? A vitamin is a manufactured thing. I think that religion obviously is a man-made manufactured thing and it can get in our way is all I'm saying. Um, I already said that. I believe that we offer at the sanctuary, we offer a sanctuary, lowercase s, from a Jesusless religion, from vitamin R. We offer a place for those choking on vitamin R to come and experience an infusion of vitamin J. I don't want to reduce Jesus to a vitamin, but um, you get the point. Peter has worked diligently to build a systematic theology around the concept of God's relentless love, and it is why I'm here. I think it's why a lot of you are here. Um, I mean, I, Tim always says to me, every time we talk, I think, he says, I just feel, he feels kind of guilty because we come to church here and we get this like huge theological treatise about <laughs> this, these concepts that are so enormous that they catch attention from across the world from people that are thinking in this area. But um, I mean, it is definitely part of why I'm here because of the way that you process it because of the way that you allow it to flow through you and be delivered. It's, I didn't plan to lock eyes and have that moment, but uh, the, the message that he's preached over time has allowed me to let go of having all the answers. They've let me see that I can actually trust God. I mean, the first time I heard Peter speak, that was the thing most people's stories are, well, I grew up in the church and I, I heard him talk and I, it was a little scary to me. My story is the exact opposite. I was like, oh my gosh, like there it is. That's, that's, gee, that's the God that I believe in. That's the God that I have hope in. Like he's there. This other guy sees it and he's there. So I had no 
alternative. <laughs> the sanctuary was the only place I could go to church for a while. The sanctuary is currently a beacon of hope to those in the faith who are wrestling with hard questions, who are living through a live-in remodel. Half their house is demolished. Maybe they don't have a working kitchen. Maybe there's ba all the bathrooms are out and they had to put an outhouse outside and use that. Um, they're knocking out walls, tearing out floors, redoing counters, moving doors, moving windows. But the foundation is still there and they're still living in the structure. But, it, but the foundation is not man-made. And this is true even in demolishing, right? In, in the whole, bring the whole building down, the foundation's still there. And our foundation is not man-made. Our foundation is Jesus. He is the living word and it is on what? we should be rebuilding and reconstructing our faith. Our faith is in Jesus, not, I don't care, fill in the blank. Um, pick whatever you want because the Jesus part is the important part. <laughs> My faith is in Jesus, not whatever. We show others that it's okay to start a remodel. It's okay to knock out a wall. It's okay to think about something that you've held on to for a long time. Well, what, I mean, if I ask that question, does the whole Jenga tower come down? I mean, probably not. God's pretty big. So, um, you know, I, I, if you have the power to dismantle the entire world's religions with one or two questions, you have a lot of power. Um, so be careful, I guess. You don't have to blow up and level your entire faith at once, though. You can knock out a wall. You can knock out a wing. You can work on it. And you don't have to dig in and defend it from being blown up either. It's an option that oftentimes gets really popular. We can't be held back by not knowing exactly what to say or how to say it right. I have a great example of me on this one. So you guys have watched me numerous times stumble through our belief statement that God is always bigger than you what thought and Jesus who is his love is deeper than you know. And, but it, it can't, just because, just because I get nervous about saying it right, it doesn't mean I don't believe it. I do believe those statements and I, I love those statements, but it's so awkward when I stand up here and I'm like, I'm going to say it wrong. I'm going to say it wrong and someone's going to know. Corrine's going to know. Someone's going to know. And it just gets in the way of me saying it, but we can't, we can't be stopped by that. We have got to share this message with others around us because it truly is liberating. We're called to more than just talking about the enormous love of God though too. There was another interesting thing that came up again. I've talked about it before. I won't bore you too long with it, but um, is this at the, at the conference, there were quite a few people who are shifting back to orthodoxy. So met some people that have one foot in the orthodox church boat and one foot in still my current church boat, right? And just kind of trying to figure it out because this doesn't look as scary. And uh, I don't know, I can't explain it, but I'll muse about it for a minute. Um, I have a good friend who became Orthodox from the Christian church, and he's constantly trying to drag me along with him, constantly trying to prove to me that it's better, and this is why it's better, and, and it isn't going to work, Bryson, so just, you can stop. I think you've given up, but um, <clears throat> I don't understand the thinking of leaving one church for another. Why is it that we seem to believe that abandoning one structure for another structure is going to solve the problem that we're working with and that we're dealing with? I don't get it. Leaving one church for another, leaving one faith tradition for another. Well, I'll try Buddhism for a while. Leaving the faith altogether and just opting for nothing. Okay, post-God world, there is no God. I don't have to worry about it. So I'm just moving on. Well, all right. Or worse, doubling down in an oppressive faith tradition, a Jesusless religion, vitamin R, just take two a day instead of one and maybe the sin will melt away. It's literally like laying in a hospital bed thinking, man, if I could just get up and get out of here and go to the other hospital down the road, I'd be fine. I'd no longer be sick. My hope is that we can continue to lead the way here as the sanctuary in showing that you don't have to move to another hospital. You can start healing right in the one that you're in. Even if it isn't the sanctuary, you can start healing right in the one that you're in. If you live in Denver and you want a break, 
Come heal with us. We'd love to have you. We would love to have you. We will give you the space to heal. We will let you explore. We will let you think through what you need to think through. We'll let you do what you need to do within reason and the law. Um, But regardless, you have to remember that another hospital isn't going to change your disease. The disease exists regardless of the hospital or church, right? They're one and the same in this analogy. The way you live through a live-in remodel is through surrender. I'm not telling you anything new. Enduring a a live-in remodel is very different from living through a live-in remodel. I'll say that again. Enduring a live-in remodel is very different than living through a live-in remodel. Living through it requires something different of you. It requires love, I think. We rebuild around and with love. When I talked with David Artman um, last weekend, he, he stayed with John and Peter. I can't even imagine. They must have been exhausted. Uh, sorry, David, but you, I told you to your face, you, he, the man was like a puppy. He was just wildly excited about being here and about what he sees in the future. And it was amazing and it really was infectious and it was great. Um, but he, he just, I mean, my goodness, I want an ounce. If he could press that into a vitamin and I could take it, I would take that vitamin because that man believes that he sees something coming that is amazing. And to be honest with you, I had felt that too And especially when I came on here at the sanctuary, it drove that decision. It was so clear to me. Um, And I still do see it. I don't know what the details are of it, but I just see a tipping point that is so close. And the more that I realize there are more people having this conversation very seriously now, I see that it's probably sooner than later. And, And tipping points are exciting and they're also terrifying because things can go wildly out of control. Anyone who's studied any startup businesses know that the, there's a great book called Tipping Point that talks about the tipping point. They never thought they were there. They thought they had lo- a long time to go, a lot more things to do, and then all of a sudden, it tipped, and they're just barely holding on to, to survive. So I, I do feel that energy um, around whatever it is that we're doing here. But what is the calling of the sanctuary? Well, It's not for me alone to say what the calling of the sanctuary is. Um, I can talk about some opportunities to be involved with the sanctuary, and that's what I'm going to do. But there are things that I'm not going to think of or talk about here that are very much part of the calling of the sanctuary, and you guys bring those. And I would invite you to bring those. Um, I'm available all the time by email and by phone if you don't blow me up. Um, But if I can pick up, I'll pick up when you call. And if, and if I can't, I'll usually get back to you in a pretty reasonable amount of time. But um, I'm, I'm open to hear all of those and muse through all of those with you. We've already heard from quite a few people online. I want to thank those people who have reached out to say, to ask very specific questions about how they can be involved and how they can help. So that's, that was great to see unfold over just the last day. Um, but opportunities, the number one opportunity is the weirdest, hardest one for us all to talk about. Peter, John, me, if you got us in a room and tried to decide who's going to talk about this, we would, it'd be a game of tag that would never end. Like we would not get anywhere near each other to be tagged for this one, but I'm just going to talk about it. Financial giving is huge for us. It is big because it does keep the doors open and it pays the bills and it pays for the the organizations that we partner with. And so as we see numbers dwindling on the finance side from actual um, regular giving, I just thought that it would be worth talking about for a few minutes. Um, it, it, I am totally uncomfortable. <laughs> Thank God I'm at least in a Metallica shirt. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it's an important part of how we do what we do. And we're going to reassess some things and we're going to look at cutting some things. But we run, I mean, really, honestly, pretty fairly lean as an organization. So there aren't a lot of areas to make just immediate cuts. Um, there are a few and we're working on those. And we'll talk, well, there'll be a dialogue that unfolds that we'll rope 
folks into, and the board will be having this discussion as well, but I just wanted to at least take the time to share for those who, um, for those who just haven't thought about it, right? Like, so this is just a few folks who aren't giving on a regular basis anymore. So if that's something that you've considered in the past and not done, or if it's something that you'd like to consider moving forward, we, we, it's important to us, I mean, it's important to all of us. It's not just important to us because it's our job, right? But it's important, I'll go get a job somewhere else and then come do this volunteer, but we probably won't do it in here if that happens. So, um, but we can do that, right? There's lots of options. But I just say it to just throw it out there for anyone that wants to, if you click on that donate button on the website, you get to the page that asks for a dollar amount and then there's an option to make it a regular giving if that is something that you believe is still part of your faith at this point. This is a part that got torn out in a lot of homes, right? They said, well, why are we tithing? Like, let's look at tithe here. We're going to tear the, the tithe building, the tithe part of the house down. And I'm not here to, to pressure you into tithing because anyone who knows me personally knows that uh, it's just not where I go. So, um, but it is important. So giving money is important, of course. We have to have money to continue. We need a certain amount to continue as is. We can, we can explore other alternatives for continuing in other ways, and that's with the board's guidance. We probably will be doing that, and that's fine. It's not scary. There's still something coming, guys. I'm just, I, I mean, if, I wish when David Artman comes back, I should make him stay with all of you so that you can just experience this excitement. Is like... I, I don't know. I, I just want an ounce of his energy. Giving with, of talents. A lot of people in this body give of their talents. And it, is, it, is, it does not go unnoticed. It's hard to recognize constantly. I even get feedback sometimes when I try to recognize people. They're like, I don't want to be recognized. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, Lynn was so wonderful to hop up and just do it. And I, I think it's... it's it's important. So if you want to give of your talents, there are things that, that we need done, probably. If you reach out to me, if you email me, I can help with that. And there are probably things that some of you would like to have done that we aren't thinking about. And you can reach out to me on those as well, and we'll connect, and we can have a conversation about those things, and then get them in the rotation of things that we're doing. Um, on the things that you want done front, that's where there's a few people, and I don't mean to miss anybody here, but I want to just acknowledge the folks that stand out in that camp. And the folks that stand out in that camp for me, obviously Jennifer Anderson stands out in that camp. She just goes and goes and goes for, for the organization. She does, um, she takes care of, you know, all the plants are, her, almost all the plants are hers. Scott brought a couple in and she's constantly working to take care of those. She's working on recycling. Whether you believe in recycling or not, we're at least offering the ability for us to try to be good stewards with our trash, right? So, it's not, we're not asking you to sign up to be a, a evangelist for recycling, but we're just asking if you could just toss this in that can instead of that can. It helps us out a little bit. But she's, she's a champion of those things and amazing. And uh, Corrine and Lynn and Judy, I know. And the, who else, Lynn? Sorry. Yeah, Rich and Sandy and Rachel. Yeah, so just really appreciated. Um, Alan and Jennifer Parsons are another p couple that come to mind here because I know that they've just hopped in and tried to organize like the big dance that they did and the, lake, the party at the lake. Like they just love doing fun things together. Matt and Tracy Kenner are another couple. Oh, Marsha too. Oh, I'll get to lunch in a minute. Oh no, she's saying, no, don't, 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 no. <laughs> don't do it. Don't acknowledge me. So Matt and Tracy Kenner, and uh, they run the men's and women's ministries, and it's hard. Like, I, I can't get people to be interested and go, right? I can't goad people to go to these events, and they look to me for that sometimes, but I'm like, you just offer it and whoever comes, comes. But they have diligently 
set aside time once a month for a space for people to come and, and be together. And I'm thankful for that. And so um, Judy West and the picnics on the patio with Jennifer, they've done a bunch of work on the furniture for us that we're gonna sit on today as we eat the burgers. It's just really fantastic. Um, and who else? The lunches, people that have helped out with lunches. It didn't make it in my notes, but I know I wrote it. Um, Josh and Courtney, Likens and Marsha, that's where you came in, sorry, has helped with lunch in the past. And I know some others too. So I think, I think Rachel maybe, yeah. No one's going to admit it. All right, but joining in a cause. So we have causes too that we support. We try to do our best to connect with organizations that are tied to someone in the body. Boring people, I apologize. I'm almost done. Um, Christ Body Ministries, we did the clothing drive. You guys were amazing on the clothing drive for them. We gave them so many clothes. I mean, I'm sure they're all used by now, but it was a, it was a wonderful thing. I'm working right now with alternative pregnancy centers. I've uh, connected with, and I'm supposed to to be picking up some materials that we can start a drive through the summer for them, for expectant mothers that are, une- <laughs> how do you say that, unexpectedly expecting. Um, so <laughs> the, the kits and the materials that they're looking for, we'll have a place to gather those in the foyer through the summer. And then I'm uh, reaching out to Beyond Home to connect with them again this fall to see if we can reconnect with them and, and help out some families during Thanksgiving and Christmas. So those opportunities are always out there. There's lunch, it went down lower. If you wanna help with set up and tear down or if you like to grill burgers and wanna help with that, Brett Davidson's helping grill some burgers today for everyone. That's always helpful. You can send all of this to me. You can call me, you can text me, you can email me. If it all comes to me, I'll get it to who it needs to get to. I'm, I'm, I'm totally happy to do what I'm here for. That's what I do. <laughs> so um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And we talked, Lynn, about even... Uh, Doctors Without Borders, I think, right? Or no, Project Cure, Project Cure. Yeah, but we never reconnected on that, but it's another one we could do. But however we serve, we must remember that we are called to the inclusivity of Christ. We are, church, called to the inclusivity of Christ. It's about more than just a bigger, better country club. It's also about more than a new country club for new people and we'll just write off the old ones. Um, Let them be in their old country club. We all struggle with the disease of sin. Instead of grouping up and lashing out at those who we think differently than us, why can't we work toward finding a way to work together in love? We need to relearn what it looks like to allow space for individuality but not defining ourselves, our entire selves, as our individuality, not defining ourselves by our selfish qualities. We watched the Jim Henson um, documentary that uh, Ron Howard did recently. My wife is a huge Jim Henson fan. Um, We both really love the Muppets, but he had a really powerful quote in there that was shared. And uh, I think he said something along these lines. If we loved each other for our differences instead of our similarities, there would be no more war. While it's hard for me personally, because I'm kind of pessimistic, to imagine a world without war that contains more than two human beings, um, I still like the spirit of the quote. I like the spirit, the idea that we could rise above the war, this war, Death, examining death, death taking over our daily functions. That's a war I could get behind protesting for sure. Making it our intention to celebrate our differences would draw us together. Not through law. It's not the legislation of morality. That didn't work, if anybody noticed. Um, Neither does the legislation of immorality. That's not going to work either. (laughs) So somewhere in there, we got to find a way to be intentional about celebrating our differences and coming together in our differences. And I think that we're leading the way in figuring out what that looks like as the sanctuary. And I'm thankful that all of you are part of that. So that's it. The word, the bread, still becomes flesh 
and it still and it dwells among us you are the body of Christ in the world told you I'd cover him up so I'll cover him up <laughs> even though it's it's Friday right now right so I'm about to switch it out to Sunday I didn't practice this it's mic so it worked <laughs> um, so on the night before he gave himself up for you he broke bread saying this is my body broken for you eat it in remembrance of me and in the same manner he took the cup saying this is my blood a new covenant drink of it all of you and do it in remembrance of me We invite everyone, and by everyone we mean all, and by all we mean everyone, to the table, to the Lord's table. There's never a time when you're more ready than now to come to the Lord's table. We invite you to come forward, take a piece of the bread, dip it in the blood. The wine is, is dark cups, and the juice is light cups. You'll know if you get that wrong. This is coffee. It will go away. And uh, take, take a piece of the bread, the body of Christ, dip it in to the, to the blood of Christ, and ingest him. It's more than vitamin J, but let's call it that for now. So God's dunamis power blasts away what's sad but true to reveal beauty. Accept the call to look at yourself when you see all the hateful or violent things that others do and ask whether you're really so different deep down inside. Ask God to change your heart rather than somebody else's. Have faith that he will do that. Have hope that he can do that and he wants to do it for so many. And be an extension of love, a vessel of mercy, in a world of death. Living in the joy of the Lord equals having faith, hope, faith and hope in love. The world works against that equation sometimes. But have faith and have hope in love, the one who is love. We all have that spirit in us that fights against the equation, right? It's part of you. It's a disease. And it might be in remission right now. Maybe it isn't and you're not here, right? So um, sometimes it rises up. It fights for us to place faith in ourselves. It fights for us to hope in us alone. Or worse, to just be hopeless. This can produce a type of love, but it's not an extension of love itself poured out on the earth in our space-time. It's a manufactured love, a processed love. You've got to avoid processed love. So in Jesus' name, be the gospel. Amen.